folks, welcome back to another episode of Token Punch Lunch. I've got a lot of good segments lined up for you this time. Uh, the contributors are still doing a great job putting their stuff together, and uh, we've got a couple of surprises. Uh, at least one contributor has a brand new segment that they're going to start uh, this episode, and then we also have uh, a reunion of sorts on another episode, so uh, or another segment rather, so uh, there is that as well. I think there's a lot of neat stuff going on in this episode, and I think you're going to enjoy it a lot. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get to it. Let's go. Hi, this is Ambie from Board Game Blitz. And I used to have a segment here where I talk about a strategic game and how the mechanisms and the theme go together well, but I ran out of games that I own and feel comfortable talking about. So today I'm going to start a new segment. Today I'm going to talk about playing games at work. I'm pretty lucky in that I work at a place that allows you to play board games and we actually had a budget to buy board games for team events. So I helped choose some games since I'm the game expert there. And we wanted games that you can teach and play in 30 minutes. And I chose a variety of games that had different player counts and different types of games. So I'll let you know what I chose and what my coworkers thought of them. We got both Codenames and Codenames Pictures. Codenames is a team word game where there's a grid of words and there's people giving clues, one word and a number of, and you're trying to guess the words that are your teams. Uh, and then the pictures is a grid of pictures, same thing. This went over really well with my coworkers. We actually had a tournament and my coworkers were playing all at the same time and had a tournament and um, everyone really liked it. Crossfire is a quick social deduction game where everyone has a hidden role and each role has a different win condition and they're trying to figure out who the other roles are and what they need to do. This one had mixed reactions with my coworkers. Some people didn't want to invest the time in learning it because everyone had a different role and it was too confusing for them. But other people, when they played the game a couple times, they really had a lot of fun. So this one took more investment because it took a couple of plays for people to actually understand what's going on but each play is like five minutes long. Pit is a card game where you're trying to collect all of the same type of card and there's different cards like uh, rice and wheat, they're different commodities, and you have a hand of nine cards and you wanna trade other cards to other people, but you just say the number of cards you're trading. So you're just yelling two, 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 and trade two cards to someone else who's trading two cards. It's a lot of yelling and very hectic until someone gets nine of the same card and they ring a bell in the middle. So my coworkers really like this, it's really easy to learn, and they liked the bell because the game comes with a little bell that you ring. <laughs> For Sale is an auction bidding game. It has two parts. In the first part, you're bidding money to get houses, these little house cards, and they're numbered 1 through 30. And then the second part, you're bidding those houses to get money. And the way the bidding works is interesting. You're, whoever bids the most gets the highest one, whoever bids the least gets the least highest one. So you're bidding relative to other people. It's pretty interesting and not too difficult to learn, so my coworkers were enjoying that, but that was a more strategic game for them if they're trying to be competitive. Sushi Go is a card drafting game where you have a hand of cards and you take one and pass it to the player on your left or right, and you keep doing that until you have a set of cards, and you're trying to collect different sushis for different points. We actually got Sushi Go Party at work, which accommodates more players, and they also have a lot of different types of sushi, so you can have variable starts. My coworkers like that a lot, and it's also one of the games that they pick if they want to be competitive. So those are some of the games that I picked for my coworkers, and they had mixed reactions. I think the best one was Codenames and Codenames Pictures because everyone played that at the same time and everyone really liked it. But we had these four team building events and we had scheduled meetings to play the games. So that was a month and a half ago and we played a lot of games then, but since then we haven't actually played any board games because we got busy and we haven't been scheduling meetings for board games. So do you play games at work? Do you have any tips for what are good games or how to get people to play games at work without scheduling a meeting? Let me know in the comments. Hey everybody, it's Jay. This time to talk about your flare. On 15 pieces of flare, I'm gonna try to show you guys some ways to spruce up that game room. Now, whenever I ask for suggestions for stuff to make for flare, typically what comes up is Cthulhu. And I had to do the best thing I could to please the great old one himself. So 
What I did was, well, let's let's check this. I gotta move this back a little bit. Let's move that back. I'm giving up a little bit of my secrets, but here we go. Ugh. Well, let's check it out. All right, for this project, we're gonna need five one by twos pre-cut to five feet long, a 90 degree clamp, a power drill with a small drill bit, a Phillips bit, and a large drill bit to act as a countersink. Some wood glue. You're gonna need 12 one and one quarter inch screws, a large shower curtain. This one was 66 inches by 72 inches, and a staple gun. First of all, I suggest starting this project on the ground. It will help with stabilization and that kind of stuff. Using the 90 degree clamp, insert your two one by twos in perpendicularly. Then align the edges of each piece. Then apply some wood glue to the end of the butting up piece. Clamp the pieces back into place, then using a drill bit that is smaller than the screws you will be using, drill two pilot holes into the edge one by two. Switch out that bit for another drill bit that is as large as your screw heads. You will only drill in enough to create a poor man's countersink. Do not drill this large hole completely into your wood. You only want the tip. Now switch out your bit to the Phillips driver and install your two screws. Now after realizing my table wasn't going to be big enough for this bad boy, I went ahead and moved to my Dungeness basement floor, which is where I should have started with in the first place. Go ahead and repeat the glue, pilot hole, countersink, and screw process for the other three corners to create a square frame. Now go ahead and install your middle support with the same process. Now that you've got a sturdy frame, you can lay it back on a table. You can then drape the shower curtain onto the frame and center it. You also might want to throw the curtain into the dryer real quick to get all the creases out first. Once you've got it centered, you can staple it down on the center of each side. When you go to staple, fold your curtain over the edge of the frame, then fold the curtain over itself to create a hem, then staple on the hem into the frame. When you go to staple the second side, pull the curtain a little tight. You don't have to tug the living daylights out of it, just pull it a little bit so it's a little bit tight. Then once both sides have been anchored down with one staple each, you can flip the entire thing over so the image is facing down. Then using the same hemming and tightening technique, go ahead and staple down the sides with about seven staples to each side. With the top and bottoms, fold the corners in like a Christmas present, and then go through and staple these sides with seven staples as well. Once you have all sides stapled down, go back and staple between each staple again, being sure to pull a little bit tight like always. Once you've got all those staples in, you're ready to flip it and stand it up. Boom! There you have it. Quick and easy way to add some big flair to your game room. I love how this turned out and I love how easy this project is. We have another one of these in our house. It's like a big octopus colorful thing in our stairwell. Um, great way to add flair. This one, I would do two things differently. First, I would use actual wood one by twos. I use those cheap pressed um, pressed wood, I don't even know what it's called, it's just like pressed particles together and gl like glue. I'm not sure exactly what it's called, but it's cheaper, but the wood splits out a little bit more when you drive them screws in if you're not, if you don't have everything perfect, and I don't ever do anything perfect, so, um, I would actually use wood instead of that, and you can't see this, but the top is starting to sag a little bit, and if you hang it, it should be fine. But if you don't, you'll, you'll need to put another support um, up and down the middle. Also, before I would mount it, I would throw it in the dryer. My wife gave me this. She told me after I had it all together, thanks a lot, Karen. But um, if you do that, you won't have the uh, creases from where it was folded all together. So those are the two things I would do differently. I'm actually just going to have to run an iron over it as it is now, and it'll be fine. But that's it. If any of you all have any suggestions for me to make into some flair, leave them in the comments below or find me anywhere on social media. Don't forget everybody, 15 pieces of flair is the bare minimum. Some people choose to do more and Cthulhu definitely encourages that. Have fun everybody.
five tribes, poppy, colorful, exotic, but also safe. And today on Rook and Record, we're picking the perfect album to pair with it. Something that is interesting and intelligent while at the same time comforting and approachable. And I can't think of anything better to pair with this beast. One of my favorite Days of Wonder games and one of my favorite games, period, by Bruno Catala, one of my favorite designers, as... Well, bam! Tragic Kingdom by No Doubt. It is exactly what I describe Five Tribes as. Poppy, vibrant, colorful, and exotic while being a little bit safe. Released in 1995, Tragic Kingdom is a fantastic, upbeat counterpoint to the doom and gloom of the grunge era, while miraculously maintaining its artistic integrity. This is the change point where No Doubt truly found their voice, equal parts punk, ska, and bubblegum pop, led by the unparalleled Gwen Stefani who can turn from a whimper to a roar on a dime, making an album of non-stop, ultra-saturated sing-along masterpieces. This is pop art in the most Andy Warholian sense of the words. And it also has that sort of Days of Wonder oeuvre of being elegant, but also poppy, intelligent, but also approachable. Five Tribes is like spiraling madness in a candy coating. It's easy to blur your eyes and just see a vast stretch of brightly colored nonsense, but upon close inspection you start to see nuance, elegance, and well-crafted sophistication that makes each turn both instinctive and visceral. There's also a physicality to it that I love as you drop pieces along the oases, rhythmic and contemplative. Another great thing about this record is that it just grooves. It has a percussive, upbeat charm that you can't help but bop along to, which can be helpful as you're trying to navigate your meeples through the spider webs or telling your opponents don't speak while you take the rest of your turn. And that is completely why I'm recommending No Doubt's Tragic Kingdom as the perfect record for you to listen to while playing Five Tribes. Thank you so much for watching the Cardboard Herald's Rook and Record. What do you think of the album? What do you think of the game? What do you want us to Rook and Recordify next? Because after all, the more that we do with these, less bad music, you will have to suffer at the table. Welcome to Jules Reviews. I'm Julie. This is the last of my series on how we've organized our game collection based on my disabilities. Today, I'd like to share with you about the categories of games that I very rarely ever suggest playing. According to the U.S. Census website, there are nearly 40 million Americans, or 12.6% of the U.S. population that experience some form of disability. Someone like me with cognitive and physical disabilities may struggle with the categories of games I'm going to talk about. Area control and player versus player. These games take way too long to play and require other players to help me with my turns, which I feel bad about. I like to play my turns on my own as much as possible, so if I win, I know I won with my own skill. I don't like these games very much because I'm not a fan of attacking other players, which is often needed to win these games. Character Power These types of games can be fun as long as the descriptions of their powers are clear and concise. If they aren't, I have to get help, which can be frustrating for me and my family. Speed Games hmm. This category of games are really frustrating for me, mainly because I don't have the physical ability or processing speed to play well. When I do play, my family often has to give me a head start or do-overs in order for me to have a chance at winning. Dungeon Master. I find these games take too long to play. It's hard for me to play games that are longer than 45 minutes. Math Games. Math has never been my strongest subject starting back in high school. I was so relieved when I realized that college algebra was all I needed for my degree. I get very confused and frustrated when dealing with numbers, and this is worse when I know others are waiting on me to finish a turn. Miniatures. For the same reasons as in other categories, miniature games usually take too long 
involve attacking each other and require a lot of assistance for me to do even basic moves. In other words, they're often too complicated for my limited working memory. Educational games. I don't pick games in this category because our boys are now adults. The very last category to go over is RPGs, role playing games. I used to play these types of games before I got sick. Now I typically don't have the endurance to commit to long gaming sessions. I really appreciate the nice comments some of you have taken the time to write. It really means a lot. I'm happy to know that this segment has given you a little insight on how playing games can be for people with disabilities. Other members of our family have had to deal with this. My brother-in-law, who died of muscular dystrophy, and my mother-in-law, who has rheumatoid arthritis. In future segments, I will discuss my favorite games in each category, even the categories I usually avoid. Thanks for watching Joel's Reviews. I'm Julie. Have a fantastic day. Welcome back to another Accessorize segment here on Token Punch Lunch. Now, we're going to talk about dice today, but more specifically, rolling dice. So let's get down to the table. So today on Accessorize, I'm going to talk about things that we use to roll these little things. Dice. Now, sometimes you can just, you know, roll the dice. You don't have to have anything. You can roll them just fine. But sometimes there are those boards and uh, tables and uh, stuff like that that have a lot of stuff out on the board, other components. And when you roll these dice, well, they get into, uh, they bump other the things off and they knock them off course or what have you. So sometimes you need something to roll dice in. And that's what we're going to talk about today. It's just a couple of different things that uh, you can use to roll your dice to make your board a little bit more tidy. Now, the first thing that we can use are dice trays. Now, dice trays are something that might look like this. This is one of my favorite ones that a, a fan has sent me. It's got the Blackhawks symbol there. Yeah, go Hawks. Um, and so, you know, this is a pretty neat thing. You just take and you roll the dice inside and it stays in a very compact area. And, uh, you know, you can, it's fairly simple to see what you've rolled, unless it's like right here, like that one right there. I can't see it, but you can pick it up and sometimes you roll it over, whatever. Now, this is a uh, very sturdy, uh, well-made wooden uh, dice tray, but there's also other kinds of dice trays like this one right here that actually can fold out. This one is specifically from Chip Theory Games. Uh, so you can unpack it like this and uh, it is sitting flat, no worries. And then to put it together, you just clip these guys together like so. And now you have a dice tray that you can roll inside and it's pretty good. This one actually is a little bit quieter than the last one as well. So uh, dice trays can come in all shapes and sizes and uh, different kinds of materials as well. Then you also have some rather extravagant uh, ways to uh, chuck dice like this one right here. Now this is actually, I believe it's called a trebuchet uh, where it's going to bend back like this. You put the dice in here and then you just roll the dice like that. Um, this is a little bit more involved and it's a little bit gimmicky, but pretty fun too. And then there is your tried and true dice tower. Now this is just, uh, this is actually a 3D printed dice tower that somebody sent us. And uh, it has this little thing up here that you can either uh, have up or have down, but it's going to just throw the dice in there and it comes right out. So it's a pretty neat little thing. Uh, if you wanted to, I believe you can take this off and just have it roll right out onto the table like so. So it's just really whatever you want to do. But uh, this is another solution to the dice rolling dilemma. But you have other dice towers as well. Like that was a pretty inexpensive 3D printed and so forth. But then you have a company called Wormwood that makes some really nice uh, dice towers as you can see here and you can just roll them inside and it all just comes right out there just like this and uh, these are really nice wood and they have a whole bunch of different kinds of uh, woods that you can use as you uh, place your order uh, so warm wood this is of course more expensive than uh, your 3d printed thing but they have a lot of different accessories as well and then you can have just some basic run-of-the-mill dice towers like this one this is actually one of the first ones that uh, Tom and I were sent way 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 back in the day 
and it's really loud and that's what I really don't like about it. The one that I have that's similar to this one has foam padding in it so it's a lot quieter and those are the kinds of things that you can look for. But that's uh, generally it. You have dice trays and those extravagant little uh, trebuchet type stuff and then dice towers and there's all kinds of dice towers that are out there. Uh, so Take a look, see what you like. And so there you have it. Uh, just a bunch of different ways that you can, uh, different kinds of contraptions and accessories that you can use to uh, roll dice during your games. And of course, whichever one you choose is probably going to be weighted upon a number of different factors. But uh, generally speaking, I just wanted to make sure that you understood and you know, you probably do, but hey, it's a good reminder that there's a lot of different solutions out there for keeping your dice uh, off of that board and not mingling with the rest of your components. Thanks for joining us. Let's get back to the rest of your lunch. Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and today I want to show you a game called Archmage, designed by Tim Hirama and published by Starling Games. In Archmage, you are going to battle against a evil warlord in order to reclaim the cursed tower at the middle in the middle of the land and become the new archmage in a world where magic has essentially died out and where only certain people have magical talent and will be able to take on that role. If you're playing with other people, you are all potential archmages and your job is to vie for control of the land and to discover the best arrangement of spells in order to score the most points and be the true new Archmage. A solo game of Archmage is going to have you vying for control over this territory against this evil warlord who is going to basically rampage all over the place and try to mess up all of your plans and claim as much territory as he can for himself. His movement is determined by a pair of die rolls. The first one will determine the direction that he moves, and the second will determine whether he goes counterclockwise or clockwise. He also alternates between these inner and outer rings on the map to make sure that he gives you a full coverage in terms of rampaging all of your work. You, as a mage, are going to spend your time moving around this map, exploring different types of terrain, gathering the relics that that type of terrain produces, which allows you to initiate apprentices into associated schools of magic and to acquire new spells. And you can also recruit people for your entourage. So you, every, every mage needs apprentices. So you can actually go collect new apprentices in various locations on the map. And then when you're not gathering resources or claiming wilderness territory, you can initiate those apprentices by bringing them to these magical races who will teach them the ways of various schools of magic. So there are different types of land on here. So we have a crypt, a library, a mine, a grove. Um, there's also ruins somewhere on here. Uh, but basically each type of land is associated with a different type of relic, a different school of magic, and as you can see through color matching, a different race that will initiate you into a different magical school. So one part of the game is spent trying to control this map to make sure that you have continued access to the resources that you need to initiate apprentices and to power the spells that they get you once they've been initiated, which is what we're going to talk about next. On top of all of the territory fighting action that will be happening on the main board, you're also going to have the floor of your mage tower. You'll place your actual mage tower somewhere in the wilderness dur during the game, but you'll always have this mage tower, which is where you keep your relics that are associated with each school of magic. There's a limit of six. It's also where you're going to put the apprentices that you initiate. For example, if I went to visit the Dryads and I initiated an apprentice into the area of nature. I would pay two relics to do that. And then I would get a green spell. See this coloring right here? These cards are a little foily. It can make them hard to look at, but it is also pretty. So then I would have access to the spell. And as long as I was able to pay the cost of one relic per basic spell of the, of the green type, so I'd have to go get some more nature relics to, to perform the spell, I could just perform that every turn. So, when you have apprentices in different areas of magic, you are able to get the associated spells and then pay the relic costs to make those spells workable in the Archmage world. The other thing that's interesting, however, is that you might be asking, how do I get my little apprentices to bump up a level and get a more advanced spell? 
Well, what can happen is that you can actually have your, your apprentices fight it out to attempt to become the one who will be promoted. And then one will make it, the other will have to leave the board and return to your company. The other thing that's interesting is that with no mages here anymore, you'll actually have to remove these spells, but you will get to replace them with a red green hybrid spell. So there are times in the game when you might prefer to have your basic spells and need to make sure that these basic areas are stocked with apprentices. But in order to get higher level spells that are also worth more points at the end of the game, you need to be promoting your apprentices. So here's the first level. And then if you have two second level apprentices, they can actually fight each other to, to reach the master level. In the solo game, you don't actually play with the master spell cards, but one of the requirements to win is that you've advanced at least four apprentices to the master level, which is no mean feat. If you're interested in a game that has sort of a Euro feel, but also a really cool theme, Archmage may be a really good game for you. My students love it. They love it so much that when I taught them how to play it, I found them talking about it in the parking lot, arguing about strategy like 20 minutes after we had finished Game Club and put the game away. And as a solo game, I like that it's not just a beat your own score game. It actually has different winning conditions than the multiplayer because you have an opponent that will try to thwart you and a specific goal to reach, a goal that's not entirely easy. I don't love that you don't get full access to all the spells in the solo variant of the game. It's not a perfect solo variant, but it's definitely interesting and if you are also in interested in games that you can play with a group, I think Archmage is a really, really good choice. If this sounds like your sort of thing, give Archmage a look. Happy gaming. Hi everyone, welcome back to Token Punch Lunch. Hey, I'm coming to you today from the beautiful Garden of the Gods in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And I'm Doug Jr. And I'm Doug the Third. Whoa, you're back. It's good to be back here with you. Just good to have uh, Doug the Third back, and he's been doing a little work over here in Colorado Springs and also overseas. He's traveled to where? Uh, Malaysia and Indonesia. Malaysia and Indonesia. Just a little, you know, pop overseas there. But it's great to have him back. We're all thrilled that he's here, and he will be joining us on future episodes, so we're looking forward to that. But right now, I want to continue our discussion on some games that you can play at your game group. Now, these aren't games that are on Kickstarter. These aren't games that are so wildly new and popular that you can't find them anywhere. These are games that you can actually get right now and play. So these are games that are actually available. So today, I want to talk to you about Century Eastern Wonders. This has become a game that uh, our family really enjoys our game group has really enjoyed uh, my wife likes this game now There's a test for you because she's not a big gamer, but she really enjoys this game and uh, Very simply this is a game where you are trying to purchase Different tokens and these different ports and these tokens are worth points and you have to have the right number of cubes and the right combination of cubes. So you have these little boats that go around and you have different transactions you can make. For instance, you might change two of your uh, yellow cubes into a brown cube or whatever the transaction. Uh, actually, there's one here that lets you change two yellows into a green. Or you might change a brown cube into three reds or something like that. And eventually you can get the right cube combination to purchase one of these four uh, tokens here that uh, offer you the victory points. So uh, it's a fun game that lets you move around this board. Now you also have to build these outposts before you can make your transactions and there are rules on your travel. You can only move one space but if you move more than one space you can do that but then you have to leave a cube and then another person can come up behind you and pick up that cube. So I mean there's a lot of uh, a lot of exciting things. Uh, again this uses four different colored cubes. The yellows uh, represent a spice that is the, the, the least expensive and then there's steps up from there to red, green, and brown. It's just a really fun game. We've really 
really had a lot of fun. The playtime is pretty short. In fact, uh, when my wife and I play, just the two of us, well, it moves right along. I think we can probably get through this in 20 minutes or 30 minutes at the most. Uh, I have played it with four people, which is a lot of fun, changes the dynamics of it. Um, but it, uh, it also lengthens the game a little bit, but it's still not real long. I'm sure we played in about an hour. And it's just a great game. So I, I thought that today we would just, since we don't have time to really cover all the rules and everything, I thought that today we would just kind of uh, go over like a pro and a con. Even though we love this game, so we're not criticizing it at all. There are always cons to a game. Yeah. Every always. game. So um, uh, Doug's just kind of been introduced to this. Uh, so we were kind of talking about it earlier, uh, pros and cons. What, what do you think would be a pro to this game, a good thing about it? Um, like you actually said earlier, a pro to this game would be simply um, the play of it. It's so simple. Um, it is, um, we talked about it a little bit earlier, and one of the things is that the mechanics of the game itself are really simple. Um, so if you're not really a gamer or you're inviting somebody that's new to it, they can play for the first time and still feel pretty confident and not get too worked up. For somebody that is a gamer, more like we are, um, it does have a feel of a heavier game where it is something you can really mentally invest in and really uh, get a lot of fun out of. Yeah, and actually, you kind of stole my thunder there because I think my pro is, <laughs> is very similar. I, I, I guess I would say this. There are a lot of good uh, choices to make in this game, so it's very strategic. It is a, a, a competitive game and tons and tons of choices there are multiple paths that can get you to where you need to be and um so it, yeah very strategic yeah. Uh, very thinky game um a lot of fun so okay we know it's a great game we like it so we're not going to criticize it but you know there are cons to everything so what what's a con if i had to pick a con it'd probably be simply the fact that it does take a while to set up it does it does there's quite a few pieces um you know, it's just you gotta lay everything out, and this is a very nitpicky thing. The game is awesome, um, but yeah, if I had to pick a con, that would be it. Just the setup time does take a little while, but on the flip side of that, it is easy to replay once you've started. So yeah, yeah, it's a, it's it's a it's a great game, a lot of fun. So hopefully, uh, you guys will have a chance to try this out if you haven't done so already. Maybe you want to add this to your collection or uh, play it at your friendly local game store. Uh, that is Century Eastern Wonders, an awesome game that I think you will enjoy. So, once again, it's been good to have you guys here at Token Punch Lunch. I'm Doug Jr. And I'm Doug III. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Hi, we're the Board Game Opinions, and my name's Jonathan Hicks. I'm Steve Rain. And I'm Mark Wendell. And today it's our Golden Ollie, and it's Stone Age, which is one of the original worker placement games based obviously in the Stone Age, and you have your workers, and essentially you're trying to acquire resources, and then you spend the resources to get points. Now the way you actually go about this is quite interesting. Let's say I want some wood. You can take a certain number of workers, and you put them on the little spaces here, and then you get wood by rolling the dice. Now if I put three workers there, I'm gonna roll three dice. You add up your total, in this case I've got 10, and then you divide it by the value of that. Now wood is worth three, it's quite cheap, so I divide 10 by three, it fits in three times, so I get three bits of wood. But obviously different resources are more expensive, gold's very expensive, so if I stuck three people on the gold spot and roll my dice, instead of dividing by three, I'd be dividing by six, so you get far fewer resources in that way. So you're collecting your resources like this, you also need to get food. At the end of each round you've got to feed your people, which is quite important, um, and then you want to spend the resources in two main places. So there are these buildings, you hand in the appropriate things, so this requires two stone and a gold, and you get 16 points. Or you can try and acquire cards. Now the cards do a couple of things, so they give you a little bit of um, a bonus, so maybe a bit of extra food here, and then also typically provide end game scoring. So this one gives you points depending on how many buildings you've got at the end, this one gives you points depending on how many tools you've got at the end. What are tools? Well, you can also go to this spot to acquire tools which help you to mitigate the dice. That's one thing about a dice game, you don't want to be just done in by bad dice rolls. With this, after you've rolled it, you can use this to kind of um, round up, if you like, and add one to the dice. So they're quite useful. A couple of other interesting spots. Uh, if you put two people here in the love hut, as they tend to call it, then you get an extra person. So that's how you get more people. And you can also go to the field spot here, which increases your field rating and effectively it reduces how much food you have to spend when you're feeding your people. Uh, so yeah, you go through, most points at the end wins. What do we think? I think it's great. I think it's uh, such a simple game. You, The more people you send, the more stuff you get. If I want to get clay, I can send one person. I might not get any clay, but if I send all my workers, if I send all five or six of them, I'm going to roll so much dice, I'm definitely going to get it. 
So although you can mitigate things by getting tools and other things you can mitigate and different things in the game, if you send more people to a spot, you get more stuff. That's how it works. And that's just, just a nice feeling. Yeah, I think certainly one, the Golden Orders we looked at, this one's one of the ones that I think is, A, it's the best because yeah. it's clean, it's relatively simple. Uh, like the combo building on, making sure you get good scoring cards for you at the end of the game because there's no point purchasing cards that are not going to help you. Uh, the, everything just makes sense when you look at the board pretty much straight off and that makes it easy to put in front of a lot, wide range of people. Yeah, it works very well with families. Um, I've played it with kids as well and they just get it. It's very straightforward. Oh, I go here, I get stuff and then oh, I can spend my stuff on the buildings or the cards or whatever. But you can play it with gamers as well, can't yeah. you? The yeah. cards become very powerful and as Mark says, combo in the cards. You know, if you're getting a lot of buildings, you want to make sure you're getting the building cards. But if you can see someone else is getting a lot of buildings, you want to get the cards to stop them getting them because they'll get if loads you, of points. If you can see someone's kind of building up a big mass of workers and a big massive engine, you can try and end the game quickly by just getting all of one particular type of building. Yeah. Those and out. it still has that kind of nice worker placement spot pressure of well, they might all eventually go if you've got enough players, which yeah, that's is important. Right. These spots are limited, so you know I might put three people in this space and now there's only four spaces left, so it, when it, by the time it comes around to Steve's turn, he might not be able to get any wood, which is quite an mm. issue because you do need to spend the resources, obviously, to get different tiles. It's nice that when you're taking your people off as well, you can do whatever reward you want, so you can take the people off here to get the wood you need to then buy the cards, mm. so you don't need it all at once, you don't need the resources to do the spot you want. You maybe the very first thing you go, ooh, it'd be nice if I could build that building, and you put that on your very first place, and then you spend the rest of your placements trying to get enough stuff so that you have a chance of actually being able to build it, even if you couldn't straight away, and then you self-defeat people. <laughs> so that pressure as well. One issue that can happen, as I said, with dice um, is you can just be unlucky. Um, but I feel like there are enough ways in this to mitigate dice, and also you're rolling enough dice. I mean, you roll mm. tons and tons and tons of dice in this game. So overall, I feel like it balances out. All right, thanks very much for watching. That was our golden oldie, Stone Age. We'll say go, and you can pick one up. You can't look at the bottom. You have to like think how many are in here. You're gonna put your little colored disc in there. Then you're gonna guess on one of these numbers. That one feels like a lot to me. Two people can go at the same one though. Hey everybody, we're back for a non-gamer insight with Sarah and Haley, and today we're looking at Igloo Pop. Let's get some gameplay and then see what their thoughts are. Okay, we're gonna get Sarah's thoughts first. So Sarah and Igloo Pop, you had to shake these igloos and hopefully guess on the right location. If you're right, you get the points that's on the card. If you're wrong, you lose a token. Until someone has all of their tokens gone, that's how the game ends, and then whoever's the most points wins. So what did you like about Igloo Pop? So I liked, well, can I say the first thing that I liked? Sure. Okay, the first thing I liked, because I got to pick out the game, is the artwork on the front, mm. because it's just yeah. very detailed, and it's beautiful. It's, it's like a piece of yeah. art. It's got a good style to it, for sure. Yeah. Um, but when we played the game, I liked kind of the guessing mm -hmm. aspect to it, and not really knowing, you know, how many beads were inside each igloo. And um, it was just kind of... I don't know, it wasn't like a high stakes Yeah, it's a game. fun like tactile activity and you're yeah. just like guessing and it's fun to try to guess exactly because you get more points. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything you didn't like about the game at all? No, not really. I mean, I liked most oh, of it. Oh, that's good. I mean, it's pretty short too, so it doesn't yeah. like overstay its welcome. So Sarah, would you recommend this to people who don't play a lot of games? I think I would. Yeah, it's pretty easy to learn and it's pretty quick as well. So yeah. even for somebody that didn't totally like it or wasn't completely on board, it's still a quick moving game. Yeah, it plays up to six people too. So that's good, you can get a big group around. So that's Igloo Pop, let's see what Haley thinks. Okay, now we're gonna see what Haley thinks. So Haley, this is Igloo Pop. You have to shake the igloo and then try to guess at the right location for how many gems are inside each of the igloos. So what did you like most about Igloo Pop? So I agree with Sarah. I really like the artwork on the box. I think mm -hmm. it's really pretty. But I also liked when I had like one token left that it was challenging to be like, this has to yeah. be correct when I, wherever I put my token, it has to be correct or I'm mm -hmm. done. Yeah, there's you know? a lot of tension in that. And it's really rewarding when you flip it up and you're exactly mm -hmm. correct. It feels good. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything you didn't like about the game? Um, the only thing that I would probably change about this game is maybe making the igloos a little bit bigger because my tactic mm. was like tipped, like to tip it yeah. and here the beads hit the side and it didn't mm -hmm. have a lot of room for yeah. the beads to move. So mm -hmm. I could hear each one hitting the wall, you know? So I really I gotcha. struggled with it. This yeah. is not a game I was very good at, but it was fun. I think it might, like kids probably wouldn't notice that, but it's kind of mm -hmm. nice you can play it with kids or adults. Absolutely. Um, would you recommend this to people who don't play games? I would. Yeah. Um, I think it's a quick and fun and pretty easy game to learn. Uh, 
And I think it adds like a little bit of challenge because you don't realize like yeah. that you really can't <laughs> hear it and you yeah. can't get it right. Like I was guessing 11 and 12 for things that were like six and I yep. was way off. <laughs> Alrighty, well, let's get to our final thoughts. Okay, everyone, thanks for watching. Those were their thoughts on Igloo Pop. We'll see you next time. But seriously, should I like be all mysterious? I'm going to ask you a question. <gasps> Aren't they so cute? No way. Do you guys ever think like when we look back at these videos, like when we're oh old and gray, God, we're gonna be like, 40. we were but weird. Cool. <laughs> Say, we're YouTubers. Are we really no, YouTubers no. though? Cause we don't do the hard work. No, he does all the hard no, stuff. But you're 12. Mm -hmm. Either of us got it. You know, these kind of remind me of those little houses that were in Star Wars. I just wanted to be on the record that I did not cheat. I'm pretty sure that was from 2014. That means you've been a nerd for eight years. Or four, nice. four years, Stop. not eight. <laughs> Cut that part out, please. Hey, oh. Can you believe these are boys? I know. They're boys? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Ba do be dop do dop do dop. This will be quick, they said. I hope we're in the center and we don't have to do this I'll all over. Check. Do you think your viewers will notice my hair is getting longer? <laughs> Two, one. Stop. <laughs> You're rocket not. In our favorite rocket ship. Okay, for... oh, I messed that up. <laughs> <laughs> Does it look good? Oh Here it goes. We don't have your mic on, so we have to reshoot this. Haley, yeah. we should just make our own channel about the board games and, and see what happens. It's all right. Oh! I can't, I can't get to the guy. You start. I don't know what I liked about it. What do you appreciate the fact that like, it was. <laughs>
I don't like the idea of using Smash Up as a gateway game because you have text on all the cards and particularly if you've got a couple of expansions of Smash Up, the, the text is going to be more intricate or there's going to be more of it. So you don't want a card game that is going to give them like, all right, I better read this one and I better read this one and I better read this one as well. And you're going to be there for a while and again, it's just overwhelming them with information. The less iconography you can come up with, the better. Uh, try to think of another example. Um, hmm, come on, go. Oh, hang on, and this one will do. Yeah, Sushi Go. Sushi Go, what iconography? You have the color, the, the picture on the card is just there for a glossy nature. So all you need to know is the bit at the bottom, and it tells you what it does. It's not a wall of text, it's not loads of text, it's a simple uh, you know, icon at the top for the rolls, for example, totaling them up. And that's pretty much it. So simple. You don't want them to be overwhelmed with stuff on cards. Because I've taught these sort of games to people where, you know, somebody has brought a game and it's like, oh, would you mind teaching this, Luke? And I do. They've brought their friend who can't, get, who has never played a game before and they've just got too much to read, too much to absorb. They can't get into the immersion or the gameplay or the engaging nature of it because they're too busy reading or trying to understand iconography. And for, there are some games like that that are bad enough for gamers. I mean, Roll for the Gal you know, Race for the Galaxy much? Hmm, yeah, even I have trouble with the iconography in that one. So that's kind of what I'm saying. You want, to, a bit like last week's episode with Less Is More, you just don't want to overwhelm that person with too much information. Keep it clear and concise. The the more that they can potentially guess half of it themselves, the better, but you just want maybe like, you know, a few icons max, a tiny bit of text, but not on every single card, you know, just a little bit, and you're well away. You know, let them gradually absorb all this extra information as they progress through more games, but for the time being, keep it simple. That's the way with gateway games. So, that's it for this episode. Hope you enjoy. Subscribe to my blog, The Boken Meeple, if you like what you see. Pass me some feedback if you want to see some improvements on this segment. Until then, I'll see you on the next Token Punch Lunch and Starting Tile. And remember, as always, it's only a game. Take care, and enjoy your lunch. So that's about it. That wraps up another episode of Token Punch Lunch. I want to thank all of you guys and gals for joining us today. I certainly appreciate it. Uh, you taking time out of your busy schedule to spend a little bit of it with us. And uh, of course, I want to thank all of my segment contributors as well. They're the ones that are putting in all the hard work. I just piece everything together. So uh, I'm just kind of the middleman here. Hope you enjoyed it though. And thank you contributors for putting in all of that hard work. Well, we're going to go ahead and get out of here. Stop wasting your time. And uh, we'll see you guys on the flip side in just a couple weeks. Take care now. Fatality.